I would now uh, like to call the open meeting of the Committee of the Whole on Monday, January 13th, 2020, back to order and remind everyone to turn their cell phones off for the duration of the meeting. And uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, I'll now ask the clerk, acting clerk, to provide a report concerning matters discussed during the earlier closed session. Yes, there was one item on the closed agenda this evening and the committee received a report from the CAO on his 2019 performance goals and measures. Thank you. We have no delegations this evening and we have no presentations this evening and we have no public notices this evening. But I would like to call on Ms. Waite to present her staff report. Ms. Waite, the floor is yours. Council, staff, and members of the public, I'm seeking Council's approval of the museum's new strategic plan for 2020 to 2023. So for some background for this, uh, to receive the annual Community Museum Operating Grant from the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Cultural Industries, museums must meet uh, standards set by the ministry. And in 2019, museums were asked to provide the current strategic plan in accordance to the governance standard. The Dryden Museum's previous strategic plan ended on June 30th, 2018. In cases like this, the ministry allowed us to submit a letter from the CAO as well as a timeline indicating that we were working on a new plan. So the ministry also requires that council approve our strategic plan. And so to develop our plan, we formed a strategic planning committee, which included city staff, our museum advisory board with one of our members here today, as well as volunteers and a representative from one of our community partners. So we've produced two documents, a technical document that um, discuss discusses the tasks and what resources will be required in order to meet all of our objectives, <coughs> as well as a public do document, which provides a high level um, overview of our goals and objectives. So for our planning process, during the summer and spring, we, our team met uh, several times and uh, and pest analysis to help determine where we saw these going in the future. And then we also distributed a public survey to receive input from the community. In the fall and winter, we took the results from the survey as well as our discussion to develop our objectives and goals for the so that we're also following the ministry standards while doing so. So we've also revised our vision statement, which is now the Dryden and District Museum will contribute to a vibrant community by preserving, promoting, and sharing history, arts, and culture. And a new mission statement, which is the Dryden and District Museum will preserve our ongoing history and engage the community by sharing knowledge and experiences. So we came up with four goals. Our first goal is promoting visibility to engage the community, visitors, and local organizations. <coughs> so some of these that we're gonna tackle is creating a greater presence outside of the museum and going on the walls. Um, also creating a stronger social media presence, including exploring options for using other social media platforms, which right now we're just on Facebook. And then we also have billboards on Highway 17 and 72, but we wanna look at the possibility of including wayfinding signs within the city. And then we also want to engage our visitors and museum members with surveys and evaluations in order to have sort of regular check-ins with the community. And then also continue to be engaged with the Sunset Country Museum Network, which meets twice a year. So our second goal is sharing experiences to discover our stories. 
So this goal sort of tackles the core services of the museum, where we're, we will develop a three-year plan for exhibits in the Leah Gardner Gallery, um, which will include what exhibits, will exhibits that will be done with community partners, as well as determining what traffic will bring in. So we will, and we're also gonna increase our education programs held at the museum, and then also look at ways to bring the museum into classrooms for those who can't come to the museum. Uh, and then we're also gonna look at enhancing the exhibit experience, both in the temporary exhibits, as well as the permanent exhibits, which through the survey, the number one way to improve learning is through creating a tour booklet. So we'll work on that. And then we're also wanna make our collection more accessible to researchers, uh, both researchers that come to the museum and also look at putting a portion of our collection online. And then also look at how to um, use audio and visuals to the best of our abilities, again, in exhibits or programs. And then also, as always, ensure any research that we do is accurate and objective. So preserving assets to sustain our facilities and collections for long-term enjoyment is our third goal. This, uh, we are working towards maintaining the conservation requirements to preserve the collection, so we'll monitor the temperature, relative humidity, and like all of that sort of stuff at the museum, as well as train volunteers on handling artifacts and making sure that any new artifact donated to us gets a And then we also had our archival coordinator for 2018-2019. There's a few outstanding projects from when she was with us, so we wanna check those ones off. And then also begin a collections inventory for the collection storage areas at the museum, as well as complete a storage reorganization project in order to make better use of the space at the museum. So then this one, so we're also going to continue working on accession our backlog of donations, and then also address new challenges that arise with more and more things becoming digital. For example, if someone wants to loan us a photograph, but they don't want to give us the actual photograph, but just have us scan the photograph, how do we handle that? Are we coming up with a different loan agreement? That sort of stuff. Um, and then also, the museum is in a historic house. That is over 120 years old. So with that, we're going to come up with some problems. So we're also going to look at creating a long-term plan in order to maintain the building. And then again, we'll to make the most efficient use of space. We're going to look for our volunteers because our is increasing. So then our last goal, uh, managing resources to ensure a sustainable organization. This goal looks more at planning, prevention, and policies. So we're gonna make sure that we follow our new vision and mission statement, continue to build a strong advisory board and volunteer base. We'll also pursue any grant applications that will apply to any of the projects that we've aligned. And then also look at starting a Friends of the Museum group, creating a risk management plan, and also make sure that we follow any city policies. So are there any questions or comments? Questions? No? I can't see uh, Councillor Bush, uh, who's joining us uh, via video conference, but uh, perhaps he has a question. Yes, Councillor McKinnon, I do. Thank you. I had my microphone on mute here. I have to get used to this new technology. <laughs> um, I do. I have a couple of comments, and um, first of all, I'd just like to say that the overall plan looks very good. It's obviously very well thought out. That's going to provide a great roadmap for the future for our museum, and. Um, I just would like to thank everyone who contributed to putting the plan together. Obviously, it took a lot of work, but it's very well presented and i um, very pleased to see all of the specific action items. So obviously, uh, your team has some specific things to look, to look at and work towards, which I think will be, uh, will be great. <clears throat> I guess the only comment uh, and request for change that I might have, and I'd be also interested in uh, my colleagues' uh, perspectives as well, and that really pertains to the very first sentence in the strategic plan under the introduction. 
And we start off by saying that Dryden is located within Treaty 3 territory. And although this may sound like a geographic statement, it could easily be interpreted as a land acknowledgement statement. And currently, the city doesn't have a land acknowledgement statement. <clears throat> and such a statement, if that's where we go, really needs to come from council. Uh, we had some discussion on that uh, started at our last council. In fact, there was a motion uh, put forward by a council member to uh, look at a land acknowledgement statement. And in fact, the motion never passed because the councillor never showed up to the meeting where it was to be presented. So it was, um, it was dropped. We had also some discussion in December on that issue, and <clears throat> Councillor Shane McKinn was looking at uh, providing council some training from um, elders, etc. So we don't really have an acknowledgement statement at this time. And you know, making these statements is obviously very serious, and the right wording and the full understanding of these statements by all parties involved is really critical. <clears throat> So as I said earlier, the process for considering a land acknowledgement statement would be for a motion to come in front of council, then a full discussion and debate, followed by a vote on the quote for whatever the final language might turn out to be. And that process would involve input from First Nations, the government, both provincial, federal, and lawyers representing the city, et cetera, who are familiar with such matters. Now, it may seem obvious or like common sense saying within Treaty 3, but what does that really mean to everybody? Does that imply that Dryden land, city, and residential and business is part of Treaty 3? Or is it severed from Treaty 3 and just surrounded by it? But those are, those are questions that once the language is out there are open to interpretation. Now we've always assumed being council and property owners that property within municipal boundaries have been exempt from three, Treaty 3 provisions, specifically the duty to consult and engage First Nations for any activities done on private land and uh, that it's not subject to considerations of Aboriginal or treaty rights of Indigenous people. Our businesses don't do that, the city doesn't do that, private own, landowners don't do that. And we have to be careful that anything we say doesn't say otherwise. And I'd just like to point out to that point, Council was made aware this week that Robert Green Lake Ojibwe Nation and the Government of Canada are in negotiations to settle a flooding specific claim going back to 1897. Now as part of that settlement process, Robert Green Lake and Canada have identified a selection area in Robert Green Lake may opt in the future to acquire land and apply to have that land added to its reserve in accordance with government requirements. In the letter from the Government of Canada, it states, and again, this was made, we were made aware of that this week. One of the paragraphs is, I am reaching out today to share information regarding the additions to reserve component of the proposed settlement agreement. Your municipality has been identified as having potential interests within the proposed selection area illustrated on the attached map, and that map was attached to the letter. As such, you are invited to seek more information, this is the municipality, to ask questions and to share any views you may have regarding the proposed selection area, which is within the boundaries of the city of Dryden. So as a municipality, we just need to understand what that flood claim means to the city and potential implications of any land acknowledgement statements on the process. We need, we need legal advice on that. We need advice from the province before we make any statements that could be construed as recognizing ownership or controllership over municipal lands. But having said all that, I know that everybody in this room and myself is committed to and eager to develop and nurture deeper relationships with our Aboriginal citizens and communities. So for now, in the absence of an approved land acknowledgement statement, and until we understand the implications of the Wabagoon Lake flood settlement, including a statement in the strategic plan that replaces that initial statement, something along the lines of the museum board recognizes the diversity that makes up Dryden's population and strives to preserve and present the history and culture of all peoples have, who have contributed to our great community. Something like that is just a suggestion I'd like to make 
and uh, remove that um, first piece about land acknowledgement until and until such time we have actually worked that issue through as a council and decide what direction to go. Um, as I say, these are, are serious issues and I, like everybody else, am looking forward to continuing to improve our relations with our First Nations neighbours and uh, to continue to develop and strengthen all of our relations with our, all of our ab Aboriginal community members. But that's my concern is we haven't got a statement now and to put one in a in a plan I think is a bit premature and should be tied into whatever we do overall as a municipality. But those are my perspectives and I would like to as well hear from my colleagues on that subject. Other comments? <coughs> Councillor McKinnon. I'd have to agree with Councillor Bush that, uh, that we have to, as a council, sit and, sit and discuss what that, that statement really means. And uh, I can't do that without, without further legal information. And uh, so I, I agree that, that that statement should be, uh, should be removed at this time and, and, uh, and replaced. And I'm the same uh, as well as that, but, but I did not read that statement in the strat plan itself. Is that correct? It's in the technical document. So the first line will appear as part of the document then? Yeah. Yeah, so I do agree that, that line should be taken out as, as uh, stated. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments? Councilor Price. <laughs> you can. Um, please, sir, yeah. on I think that we should remove it and then uh, once we are uh, fully committed to um, what that exactly means for us uh, I'm sure at that point we can uh, put that back in or or make make the proper statement at that time so I agree with Councillor Bush and with uh, our other two councillors at this point. Any other comments? <clears throat> Any comments just generally about the plan? No. Uh, uh, no. Yes, Councillor. Yes, this is an excellent plan, plan Bethany, and I, I appreciate what goes into a strap plan, having lived through several myself. Uh, nothing but hard work, and, and uh, it's really good to see that your volunteer base is increasing and, and you've got some really dedicated board members that, that have uh, <coughs> enhanced our museum very much in our community. Thank you. And as well, Anthony, I mean, I sit on the board, so I know the work you guys do, and at the end of the day, um, I do, I'm glad that you're looking at outside the museum, like going to other places, because we have such neat items in our collection that, that should be displayed, you know, it's almost hidden away, right? So we should bring it out to the public if we can. So, you know, so the, the strap plan is right on. You've done a good job with that, and I appreciate the hard work that you guys do. Thank you. Councillor Price. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Carlucci and Councillor uh, McKinnon. Um, when reading the strap plan, there were certainly a lot of really cool ideas in there. I love the fact of the self-guided tours and then also the tours that will be uh, led during uh, during the summer. It's a really great idea. I've been part of them in other communities, in smaller communities and larger communities. Um, and I think that's uh, a very innovative way of, of getting people involved and also getting um, new visitors to come in and participate within our community. Um, the pop-up exhibits is, is also another really good idea and I'm sure that um, you know if you approach the downtown business core for sure that they would be really interested in, in helping out in any way. So when reading this um, strap plan over, I've, I've read it a couple of times and, and you've done an amazing job with it and I um, certainly look forward to seeing everything come to fruition on it. So good job. Anyone else? So I, I, applaud, I applaud the efforts uh, from yourself and your committee. 
uh, in producing such a, a comprehensive plan. I, I'm particularly happy to see under, I believe it was uh, increased accessibility, uh, the potential to digitize back copies, I hope back copies, of the Dryden Observer. Uh, in my mind, um, that is a, a reflection of our history and our culture that uh, is, is really precious and we need to, to, I hope we have access to all the back issues and able, we're able to digitize it as long as that paper was in existence. And I think prior to that is poss possibly the Wab Wabagoon Star, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Um, and I also like your efforts uh, on creating a Friends of the Museum. I think that will be a big benefit to the museum down the road, uh, certainly financially, if, if nothing else. But uh, uh, I think there's a lot of people in this community who really love our history and they want to participate, maybe not in a board setting, but certainly as a friend of the museum. So I applaud you for that. Um, so thank, thank you to all your, your board members and uh, to those on your, on your committee for creating this. So uh, we're going to move this forward with an amendment uh, to the next regular meeting. We would bring a motion to the next meeting, yeah. There would be a motion at the next meeting. Everybody all right? Yep, yep. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Mr. Nesbitt. Just a quick comment, uh, Bethany. I want to I just thank you for, uh, for the plan. Uh, please extend my thanks to all the advisory board members and the volunteers. It was great to hear you mention that... Uh, that there's more volunteers coming on board. That's uh, that's always a good thing to hear. So I mean, great work, not just for the for the plan, but uh, but for every day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next, we have Mr. Hawkins to present his staff reports. Welcome, Mr. Hawkins. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of council, uh, members of the senior management team, and uh, many remaining members of the public. Um, tonight, uh, I'm here to present a couple of reports based on the Blue Box program. Um, this, the subject matter is complex, um, so I brought in some visual aids. I'm hoping that helps everybody to understand the subject matter a little bit better. But, but um, to, to be clear, the report we're delivering right now uh, and the second report our four information purposes tonight, we're going to um, try to bring everybody up to speed on the blue box because it's not, it's not simple subject matter. So we want to get everybody up to speed, especially going into the conference season, uh, Roma and Ogre. We want to make sure the councillors all understand what's going on. And to be clear, the changes to the blue box program that we're going to talk about tonight are well down the road, three, three to five years down the road. Um, so without further ado, I'll dive into the staff report. Um, the recommendation is that the information is received for information purposes. I want to talk a little bit about the Blue Box Program Plan. So the Blue Box Program Plan is, uh, plan is well known throughout the province of Ontario as the way that Ontarians recycle eligible common materials like plastics, aluminum cans, tin cans, cardboard and paper packaging. What's less well, widely or less profoundly understood is how municipalities are involved and, and how we got there. The first Blue Box Program plan took effect in February 1st of 2004. The Blue Box Program was established in <coughs> regulations under the Environmental Protection Act, uh, Ontario Regulation 101-94, the recycling of, and composting of municipal waste. Um, among the many provisions of OREG 101-94 is that communities with a population greater than 5,000 who manage the waste of the community must have a Blue Box Program. <clears throat> so as you can see, first Blue Box uh, pilot programs started in Kitchener in the 1980s. 
uh, heavily involved with the soft drink industry who were just starting to create uh, plastic packaging for Blue Box. In the 90s, we, um, we saw the regulation come in with, um, with the minimum population criteria um, and uh, a method of establishing gov government funding for the Blue Box program was brought forth. In the 2000s, it was enshrined in the Waste Diversion Act uh, and new programs were added for tires, electronic waste and household hazardous waste. <clears throat> Until recently, and up until and including now, the Blue Box program is set up so that producers of the Blue Box products, uh, producers like ne Nestle, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, and many, many others, uh, pay in conjointly with a fund. And you can see where it says 50% funding coming from the brand owners and 50% funding coming from the retailers or first importers, those that would bring products into the province uh, on trucks would be responsible for cost sharing 50% of the funding to Stewardship Ontario of the Blue Box Program Plan Fund <clears throat> based on how much material they imported and sold in the province of, Ontario's, um, of Ontario. Municipalities then would typically deliver the services that we all know as the Blue Box, which includes the picking up of your Blue Box materials at the curb, uh, the delivery to the 502 landfill uh, cross docking facility, the shipment into the processing plants that process the material and sell it to the market and ultimately the processing of that material. <clears throat> you can see that where we live is um, with funding from Stewardship Ontario, uh, delivering the service to consumers and eventually making the material go to processors and eventually to recyclers who return it into the product stream. Um, Eligible municipalities then, at the end of the year, submit tonnage data. This is what we do typically in March or April of every year. Is you can see we complete the municipal data call at the top, which brings our information on how much it costs to run the program um, into the pay-in model, or what's called the municipal funding allocation model. Um, likewise, stewards submit the reports of their activity to the fund, uh, make their payments on based on supplied uh, quantities to the fund, and at the end, the result is the blue box fee schedule. Essentially, a list of municipalities, the amount of recycling that's taking place within their municipalities, and what they're eligible for in terms of the fund from Stewardship Ontario. <clears throat> The, uh, the marketing of the Blue Box material uh, through Waste uh, Diversion Ontario includes the MFAM model, the Blue Box fee schedule, uh, which determines what percentage of the fund that each municipality of all the municipalities in, on in Ontario would receive from the funders to cover their eligible costs. Typical results of the MFAM uh, appropriation process see the City of Dryden receive less than 50% of our cost of the Blue Box program plan uh, as delivered in Dryden. Often the cost recovery from the municipal data call is closer to 33% or 35% of our program delivery costs. The remaining costs to operate the Blue Box, Blue Box program come from waste management fees. Um, and uh, the full cost recovery only ever occurs when both waste management, the, the taking of solid waste at our landfill, and recycling are uh, cost neutral or earn revenue after operations. The data call information also allows us in waste management to calculate how much material is being diverted from the landfill. And let's remember that the reason why we got here originally was to keep materials that can be recycled out of the landfill so that we lower the amount of material that's going into the landfill and thus extend the life of our landfill as long as possible. <clears throat> so this is a complex graphic, but it's mostly just to illustrate a timeline of how we got where we're going, which is that the prices of blue box processing materials are skyrocketing right now. Uh, in 2013, the, uh, China implemented what's called the green fence, which is essentially that products shipped to China, uh, recyclable materials to be processed, uh, started to see increased residue uh, constraints and eligibility constraints. So they started to tighten the um, eligibility criteria of what materials Chinese importers could accept of blue box materials, which placed pressure on the market in North America for blue box materials to be processed or recycled. Furthermore, in 2017, China's National Sword Program did much of the same thing and further reduced what people could bring into China and recycle and the, the, uh, the way they could bring it in. So residue, contamination, and other, um, other elements which effectively reduced the amount of products that are in the blue box basket of goods that could go into China. That pressure has flowed down to North American markets and has caused us um, to see price escalation on all blue box material. <clears throat> so in the early days of the Blue Box program, 
the prices were often favorable to municipalities. At one point in time, we were even receiving payment per ton for cardboard. Uh, that's not happening anymore. Within the last two years, most of those markets um, have switched over to cost in the city. Box materials, the most commonly processed uh, blue box materials, plastics, aluminum cans, and paper packaging, are up to $110 a ton for us right now. Uh, cardboard is actually costing us $35 a ton to be processed right now. We, we don't get paid back for cardboard, <clears throat> which is a common misconception. And all of these materials require shipping out of the province to Winnipeg to be processed. There is no processor um, close to Dryden that can offtake these materials and then process them and sell them to an end market. The shipping cost to Winnipeg of processed tons is about $80.49 a ton. So we are, we are paying for this material to move. Now in 2016, the Ontario government introduced the Waste-Free Ontario Act, which included the Waste Diversion Transition Act to replace the Waste Diversion Act and the Resource Recovery <coughs> and Circular Economy Act. The purposes of these pieces of legislation is to establish a new full producer responsibility regime wherein producers are responsible for their packaging and accountable for recovering the resources used in packaging. The Act also mandated the replacement of Waste Diversion Ontario with a new organization called the Resource Productivity and Recovery Authority as the agent responsible for the oversight of the system. <clears throat> There are many benefits to a full producer responsibility model, including that when producers pay for their end of life of their packaging, they make better choices about the packaging they use. <clears throat> Uh, producers earn revenue from their product sale. When you buy a bottle of Pepsi in the province of Ontario, they earn money off of the brown liquid inside, <coughs> and um, they should bear the cost of their packaging and the end of their uh, life. The cost of that packaging should be borne in the cost of their product. That all generators of waste should include the cost of their waste uh, disposal in their product if they sell material in the province. Uh, producers might also be the off-taker of the material at the end. You can see as the, as the wheel turns, retailers sell the product, consumers purchase and consume the product inside of the packaging. Um, some producers can, like SodaStream, have take-back programs where they automatically recycle their, their products packaging. Uh, but in many cases, the people who make these plastics want them back to make new plastic. So it just makes sense to have full responsibility for the producers when they make their, uh, make their profit off of the off of the packaging in the province of Ontario. And municipalities have very little oversight, control, or influence on packaging decisions. So um, we, we bear the cost of maintaining the blue box program, even when commodity pricing is shoving the, the numbers higher. Um, but we have no real ability to affect change over the packaging. Um, the, f the final change is to how producer responsibility is implemented or yet to be decided. Um, right now, the provincial government is developing the regulations. Um, and asking for input from AMO and other municipal professionals in waste management. To that extent, they've, uh, they've held workshops um, throughout the province of Ontario, including some in Dryden. <clears throat> so the timeline for the transition from where we are now, which is the original model of everybody paying into the fund and municipalities seeing about 33 to 35% cost recovery on delivering those services, um, Roughly looks like this. In, in August of 2015 or of 2019, um, Minister Urich announced that the blue blue box transition program to for full responsibility for producers would would go forward. The timeline is as follows: Right now, 2019 and into the end of 2020, the wind up plans for Stewardship Ontario, that governing body that's being replaced by the RPRA, are are coming to full fruition, and the development of the regulations which govern blue box are rolling out through the RICRA right now or the um, Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act. Um, by January uh, of 2021, full uh, producers will have had to establish producer responsibility organizations, or PROs, and plan to assume control uh, and work with municipal governments and service providers to prepare for the transition when they take responsibility for their end-of-life packaging. <clears throat> From January 20, uh, 1 of 2023 through December of 2025, individual municipal programs like ours in Dryden uh, will make the transition to full producer responsibility. Uh, but the province has said no more than one third of municipalities should transition at any given time. Exactly how the transition takes place is yet to be determined uh, through the development of the regulations. What is known is that the municipality will continue to receive funding under the current format until the time the transition is made. So what we're doing right now continues to be what we'll do uh, until the actual transition takes place. New services added by the municipality after August of 2017 are not eligible, but none have been added in the city. Right? And the municipality 
municipality will have first right of refusal to enter into agreements with the and continue to deliver collection, shipping, and processing services. If the municipality elects to exit the operation of the Blue Box program, the PROs will have to deliver the same services as currently exist, where they exist, and no less than five weekly collection if offered otherwise. So the idea is that the Blue Box has delivered to the residents of Dryden it will not change. What's changing is the PROs, these yet to be established organizations, could actually set up bricks and mortar um, infrastructure like the facilities that we have at the 502 landfill and actually collect off of the curbside and ship and process these materials. Or the PROs could negotiate with munici municipalities to continue in the way that we're working right now, uh, similar to the way that the fund is currently set up, which would place us at the negotiation table with those PROs <coughs> at the point in time where they affect transition. The PROs could also negotiate with mun municipalities to contract managed services at the local level. Um, we have contract collection of curbside blue box and waste right now uh, through a contractor and the PROs could elect to use us as the bridge uh, to those same contract services and simply work with us to negotiate us as the contract manager for the same charrette of services that we offer right now, collection, shipping and processing. <clears throat> So what does it all mean to drive the, the concept of transition and where we go? Um, currently, right now at the landfill, we own um, the, uh, the unused or the closed uh, material recycling facility, the MRF. We have a trans store trailer, um, which uh, tips the tip, or a trans store recycled tipping unit, which tips the blue box as it's taken from the collection trucks into the uh, compaction trailers. Um, we own one compaction trailer, and we own some uh, shunt trucks and light appurtenances at the landfill to move the blue box material around and get it ready to ship into Winnipeg. <clears throat> the municipality is currently in a multi-year contract for curbside collection recycling with B&M Delivery Services and we're in a year-to-year -year agreement or partnership with the City of Kenora over interprovincial hauling of material to Winnipeg which is uh, up for renewal right now and uh, has been mutually agreed between the City of Kenora and the City of Dryden to include escape clauses for transition such that if we both approach transition that our agreement to And uh, we are at will processing with a company called Cascade Recovery in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which basically just means that we're paying the going market rate for blue box materials and uh, corrugated cardboard as we process them. We have no written contract that says we will process only with them for an extended period of time. We are taking the current commodity price in the market. <coughs> so transition has both potentially good or potentially elements for the city of Dryden waste management and the recycling operations. Um, we did a quick SWOT analysis mock-up of, of what, what this means to us in 2023 when transition becomes, uh, becomes inevitable. Our strengths uh, include that the year-to-year -year contract for hauling with the city of Kenora is generally viewed as favorable because of its ability to dissolve at the point in time where we transition. Um, cooperating with the city of Kenora and other regional partners is also viewed as, as a strength since the combined bargaining strength of multiple municipal municipalities could be leveraged if municipalities want to stay involved in recycling services as contract managers or service providers to the PROs. There is strength in multiple, municipal multiple municipalities going to these large facility organizations as a block. <clears throat> um, with the expiry of the collection contract in 2022, the municipality may be able to negotiate with B&M to extend the current contract until transition planning is firm or known. Um, certainly, the development of the regulations will be inside of the existing collection contract, so we will know more before our collection of curbside recycle is, uh, is up for contract renewal, uh, which is generally considered favorable for transition. The at-will position of processing with Cascade Recovery is, considerable, is considered favorable for transition in, insofar as if the PROs mandate that a certain processor would be used or a certain facility would be the one that all recycling in Dryden or in Northwestern Ontario goes to. Because we're at-will, we can move easily. We're, we're well positioned to uh, transition um, processing services. Our assets, the trans store tipping facility um, and, uh, and the, uh, the setup at the 502 landfill, um, is in a stage in its asset management life cycle where it's not very, very old and needing immediate um, investment, reinvestment, and it's not brand new, meaning that it doesn't run the risk of being a stranded asset that we set up to do recycling and that we can no longer use if we transition out of recycling. 
And it's also, um, it's a compaction unit, so it's useful in, in waste management services otherwise. And the light appurtenances, the transfer truck and small appurtenances are relatively small and all usable in other uh, portions of the waste management businesses. Um, our weaknesses are, are essentially the at-will position of the processing recycling material with Cascade Recovery in Winnipeg, and it's mostly a weakness in not transitioning. Our current commodity pricing uh, that, we're, that we're taking right now is, is going up and expected to continue to go up uh, as markets are not uh, very dense with people ready to take the recycled material. Uh, and the risk of China's green fence and, green, and uh, national sort programs is, is real. It's affecting prices in North America. But we do have opportunities in transition too. The old uh, MRF or the material recycling facility is empty right now. Um, it's already a de facto stranded asset of our, our previous um, recycling work that we no longer do. Um, it could be possible to work with the PROs before or after or even during transition with this facility. If somebody was interested in being involved with the processing or offtaking of recycling, there's a building there that, that works for, um, for recycling. Um, and if processing of materials through transition was to move closer to the city, then our overhead uh, related to shipping just goes away. We're paying $80.49 a ton right now to ship our materials to somebody who will take it. If a processor was closer to town, uh, anywhere closer to town or in town, uh, we immediately see the benefit in the reduction in shipping costs of blue box materials. There's also an opportunity to, again, work together with um, local organizations, including First Nations, to gain bargaining clout with PROs if the region elects to continue to stay involved as contract managers or direct service providers. So, so at the point in time in 2023, 24, 25, whenever we may transition under the RPRA, there's some, there's some good stuff about transition that, that could be a real opportunity for the city of Dryden. But there's also threats. Any, any scenario where we stay well positioned in 2023 or ready to transition out of our contracts for processing, shipping and, um, and collection in 2023 obviously places um, risk at staying ready. If, we, if we're eligible in year one, if we're ready to go with no buyout of an existing contract in year one, holding that on through 2025 becomes renegotiation contracts through the transition. And um, there's also that risk of 2022, which is the end of the B&M contract to the starting of the first year transition, um, where we'll have to come up with some <coughs> collection, uh, either with B&M or through other forces or our own forces to continue collection until transition can be um, taken care of on recycling in 2023. There's also um, the, the reality that the municipality right now collects recycled material and solid waste. Despite any transition of mm. recycling material to someone else's responsibility to collect it, we will still be in the business of collecting solid waste. Uh, we still collect people's uh, curbside waste and take it to the landfill with collection trucks that are our responsibility and under contract to the Waste Management Department. We also run the risk of uh, in transition from our responsibility to the PRO's responsibility to use this or to collect and, and distribute this material. Um, we lose some data related to how much material we're diverting from the landfill. Currently, we can tell you approximately how much material was sent to recycling and didn't make it into our landfill. That, that's less apparent uh, to us if somebody else is dealing with the blue box. We could tell what our waste volume is and whether it's up or down, but we won't really know what <laughs> amount of recycling material is not going into the landfill without something like waste auditing which would, it, it's exactly like it sounds. It's starting right now, spreading the waste out on the ground and counting how much of it is recyclable, how much of it is actual waste. And then after transition, doing the same thing to gauge whether or not more or less diversion is happening at the landfill. And that's definitely a risk and threat to transition. Um, so right now, there, there, are no, um, there are no asks uh, based on the transition. It is something that we can see through the report happens down the road in, in 2023 to 2025. Um, but we wanna bring everybody up to speed on where we are and where our position is. And we are in a good position to transition early or, or, or throughout um, at this point in time. But we do see increasing risk as we go later into the transition schedule. If we get to 2025, those commodity prices um, that, we are, that we are paying to have people process the material and receiving 33% cost recovery on can continue to go up. Um, and it is the opinion of the people working in waste management and recycling that we probably should I transition as soon as possible within the available years. Um, so I, with that, I'd, I'd like to offer this as the first of two reports and can answer any questions now on this subject matter, understanding its complexity. There are questions. Councilor Carlucci. Through you, through the chair. So just a question. So are you saying that we're 
Is recycling costing us the city money now, or are you saying we're recovering 33 percent? No, the recycling is costing the city right now, and we're of our budget. We are cost recovering about 33 percent of that cost through the stewardship program. The rest is all uh, with being born within the city budget for waste management. So, do we have a number that is costing us? Is it maybe Steve is a better person to answer that? I'm not sure, but. The recycling budget um, is is a pro and again this is something I can get back to you with more information with more granular information on, but our recycling budget includes our household hazardous waste day activities overhead related to the plant at the 502, but sits around the 400,000 to 450,000 dollar mark, and our cost recovery is typically around the 100 to 120,000 dollar mark. Yeah, thank you, Councilor McKay. Thank you. Um, the PROs, they're. Uh, they're current. Are they going to be industry trade groups that are, are undertaking this as, as PROs? Yes. So, okay, so the idea is that, let's say, the electronics industry sets up a PRO, and then they have to approach us as a municipality and say, will you look after our waste, or we want to do our waste, or we'll make a deal with B&M, like, like those kinds of scenarios. That's correct. And the PROs will have targets amounts of material that they must recover based on how much they have imported or sold into the province. Into the province? What about a target for dry? The, there's, uh, there's mechanisms of region uh, that are being discussed right now in the development of the regulations. A lot of this is right now to be determined. Okay. So where uh, uh, the recommendation was, I think you may mention, was that we should transition uh, sooner than later. So where are they? In the, when do they? You might have said, when do these PROs have to be set up and ready to go? Well, the the regulation must be developed by the end of 20, 2021, okay. um, and that's pre uh, setting everything up through twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two for them to be ready to make transition by the start of twenty twenty three. All right. So if we do, we want to be first in the ground, and like it's like buying the first product, all the glitches aren't out yet, type thing? That's, if that's we, fair. If, if we transition in 2023 and they're just getting set up, it might be that we might uh, end up with a little bit of problems that aren't, aren't of our making. It's, it's hard to say because we don't really know what the mechanism of transition was, will be, how the PROs will be set up, if there will be regional uh, quotas or targets for the PROs, and uh, whether the PROs will be the same throughout the entire province. So we don't currently know, and we'll need to see the development of the regulation in order to understand a little bit more. All of this is uh, way in advance of any negotiation, right? Because we are, deliver the existing services and have uh, have input into the existing services at some point in time uh, if we choose to remain involved and don't simply wash our hands of recycling as a whole uh, there's some point of negotiation uh, which we would have to go into with the PROs as either contract managers or as service providers Thank you. at that point in time we we'd be talking about the price of those services okay councillor Bush I can't see you uh, whether you have a question but uh there we go. Uh, no, I don't, uh, Councillor McKinnon, uh, through the chair. It's, um, somebody's going to end up paying for this, and it's going to be the consumer one way or the other. It'll just be interesting to see how it all shakes out at the end of the day. Very good. Uh, thank you. Can we move on to your next report? Okay. So the second report, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of council and the public, I, the second report today is um, titled The Transition to Full Producer Responsibility. And Councillor Bush, there's no visual aids on this one. We're just, uh, we're just delivering the report. Um, the recommendation is that council provides a resolution on their preferences for the timing of the transition of the Blue Box program to full producer responsibility. Um, so municipal governments have been advocating for over a decade for producers to have full fiscal responsibility for the end of life management of their packaging, printed paper and paper products, uh, printed paper, cardboard and paper products. Producers are the ones best positioned to reduce their waste, increase the resources that are recovered from their waste and reincorporated into the economy to enable a consistent province-wide system that makes recycling easier and more accessible. In August of 2019, Mr. Yurek announced that the Blue Box program will be transitioned to full producer responsibility over a three-year period based on the report on the Blue Box mediation process. 
uh, entitled Renewing the Blue Box, Final Report on the Blue Box Mediation Process. <laughs> Municipal governments played a key role in helping to develop the recommendations within the report. These recommendations broadly reflected the positions advocated by AMO, and there was a great deal of alignment with the producers on how the Blue Box should be transitioned. The Minister wants to ensure that the transition blue box system is affordable for producers, workable for the processing sector, effective and accessible for residents. Uh, AMO and the municipal representatives are involved in the consultation process to develop a new regulation for the blue box. The province's intent is to finalize a resolution by the end of 2020. AMO staff held in-person workshops on the blue box transition across the province through Novo October and November 2019 to discuss the topic with municipal waste management staff. Over 165 staff and elected officials attended the sessions in Vaughan, London, Smith Falls, North Bay and one here in Dryden. The, pro the workshops provided an opportunity to engage directly with the RPRA and other industry members and to build understanding about the transition process. So waste management staff from the City of Dryden, including myself and Blake Poole, attended those sessions. It's still early in the process and much discussion, um, much of the discussion is about how to prepare for the change, what factors might, might be considered as to when a council might want to transition, which is why we're here uh, well in advance providing information to council and bringing everybody up to speed on the Blue Box program. So the resolution uh, that's going to make its way to the regular sitting of council um, this month um, will be used to help map out an ideal transition timeline for the entire province and determine whether there are years that are over or undersubscribed for transition. It's been dictated that a rolling total of up to one third of the blue box programs may transition each year. This information will also allow AMO and the province to better understand where there are conflicts. If there are too many conflicts, the province may still need to retain a third party expert to develop a methodology as to how the blue box will transition. But rather than deferring to the province to retain an expert immediately, we think that this information would be uh, useful and a good basis for a more informed decision to be made. And there are no financial implications of, of the resolution that's going to make its way to Council next week. And, and I realize, Councillor Bush, that, um, and all councillors and the Chair, that um, the resolution isn't on the, um, uh, the package materials today, but I do have it and I can read it. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. It is an AMO draft resolution uh, with our information filled in. So the, the resolution that you'll see next week um, is something along the lines of whereas the amount of single-use plastics leaking into our lakes, rivers, waterways is a growing area of public concern, whereas reducing the waste we generate and reincorporating valuable resources from our waste stream into new goods can reduce greenhouse gases significantly, whereas the transition to full producer responsibility for packaging, paper and paper products is, a criti is critical to reducing waste, improving recycling and driving better economic environmental outcomes, whereas the move to a circular economy is a global movement and that the transition of blue box programs would go a long way towards this outcome. Whereas the Corporation of the City of Dryden is supportive of a timely, seamless and successful transition of blue box programs to full financial and operational responsibility by producers of packaging, paper and paper products. And whereas the Association of Municipalities of Ontario has requested municipal governments with blue box programs to provide an indication of the best date to transition our blue box program to full producer responsibility, that it therefore be resolved. Uh, that the Corporation of the City of Dryden would like to transition their Blue Box program to full producer responsibility as soon as possible and by January, 20, for, January 1st of 2023 if allowed and that the decision is based on the rationale provided in the staff report changes to the Blue Box program including that the Blue Box collection contract status is in a favorable position to transition as soon as possible that the Blue Box processing contract status is in a favorable position to transition as soon as possible that the Blue Box shipping contract status is favorable in transition to as soon as possible that blue box stranded asset position is minimized, that current risks to cost recovery in blue box operations are substantial and increasingly unknown, and that the Corporation of the City of Dryden would be interested in providing or managing residential collection services to producers should we be able to arrive at mutually agreeable commercial terms. And further that, any questions regarding the resolution could be directed to Roger Nesbitt, Chief Administrative Officer, um, and further that the resolution be forwarded to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Questions? Councillor McKenna, I have a question or comment, I guess, for um, Colin. Um, I'm kind of in line with Councillor McKay in, in terms of wanting to push this out as far as we can unless we get an early indication that there's some real savings or some real advantages for going early. <clears throat> and there just looks to be, to me, to be a lot of uncertainty in terms of how this uh, whole supply chain, reverse supply chain is actually going to work and 
how the uh, how the whole system is actually going to work with a different organization in place. And I'm kind of in favor of seeing what the <clears throat> early implementers learn from their experiences and pick the best of what they do. Again, unless we get an early indication that we're going to save some real money here by going early. It just seems to me that there's a lot of unknowns in this whole thing. Mr. Poole, comment. I'll just re, re summarize one point to Councillor Bush, which is that right now we're paying something for Blue Box and receiving 33% cost recovery on it. 
the, the remainder of that is, is borne by the city of Dryden. And one version of producer responsibility is that we're simply no longer paying the money we paid up front and not recovering the 66% of the cost recovery that we don't see right now. Not being involved is, is substantially cheaper than being involved and in being paid for 33% of the work. Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, through the chair, just um, just looking at the staff report and, and uh, just in case anybody is missing it, staff is definitely recommending to uh, create the resolution to state that, uh, that we're looking to transition as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't uh, specifically state that in the, in the report uh, uh, recommendation, but uh, the treasurer, myself, and public works management are all are all recommending that. Thank you. Further questions? So this will move forward to the next regular meeting in the form of a resolution. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Chief Grimwood, welcome. Pardon me? Thank you. Do you want it back over there? So 
it, it's a little misleading. I, I really like to just focus on the number of firefighters we get on average and our average response time. And then the rest of the report, uh, I went through and listed some of the uh, some of the more public and significant incidents that we attended, just to give a sense of how many firefighters and how many trucks were getting to a major incident. It, again, the, the number of firefighters that we really need to manage an incident ranges from as few as three for a non-emergency or, or very minor type of call to as many as, as 20, 25 for a larger structure fire. So uh, going through that significant incident summary gives you a bit of a better sense of uh, how we're mitigating emergencies. And then the last page, a uh, couple of typos there where it says uh, third quarter. Uh, that does mean fourth quarter. So in the fourth quarter, uh, the firefighters committed 590 hours of training, which, which is pretty significant. Uh, the fire department had been through quite a period of instability earlier in the year. So we really made up for lost time doing a lot of training in the fourth quarter. I outlined the various subjects. and. Uh, you know, the training is, uh, not only does it make them safer and more effective, it really brought them together in terms of team building and morale building, and really did a lot for the department. Uh, and then lastly, in the fourth quarter, which included fire prevention week, uh, the firefighters committed 215 hours of their time to public fire safety education uh, and fire prevention, which is absolutely incredible, considering most of those activities occurred during the day, during the week. Uh, we managed to visit uh, every school in the city and provide public fire safety education in the absence of having uh, full-time fire prevention officers. So that was all volunteer work. So I'm happy to take any questions you have on this report. Questions? Great job. No questions? Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question, uh, Chief, and uh, I, I guess it's in regards to staffing. And I note that uh, from 2017 to now, uh, certainly Hall 1 is down 17 uh, firefighters. And I know you're actively recruiting. Now, some of these firefighters, I assume, retired, and some were caught up in the issues of the day. Is there an effort to... Um, recruit fully trained firefighters that uh, we have in the community. I, I know that we've, uh, as a city of Dryden, have trained these, these folks, some to specialties. Um, and that would be to your advantage to have them on board, I assume. So is, is that uh, happening, Chief? them to apply. We've actually had inquiries from firefighters, from people who live in Dryden but serve on the Oxford Fire Department who are interested. Again, they, they come with significant training. We're encouraging them to apply. And we've had interest from people with no firefighting background. And again, we're encouraging everybody to apply. Uh, the selection process is going to be fair and transparent and consistent. You know, what do we look for in our firefighters? We look for availability. We look for the ability to commit the time necessary. Uh, and then we look at training and mechanical aptitude and some of the skills that they can bring. Sometimes that's previous firefighter training, and sometimes those skills come from other places. So ultimately, uh, we're going to choose the, the best candidates, but we are encouraging everybody to apply. Well, I, I hope some of them realize that you bring uh, a great deal of uh, excellent leadership to the organization, and they take advantage of of that application, so I, I hope they do. Any other questions, comments? Your next report, please, Chief. My, my next report follows up on uh, a project that was approved as part of the capital budget, which is to replace the 1996 pumper truck that currently uh, responds from all two. <coughs> so in the capital budget, we budgeted uh, a $500,000 purchase price, but we budgeted it as a capital lease with uh, $113,280 committed in year one, and the remaining amount of the money financed over multiple years. Uh, this is a strategy that a lot of fire departments are moving towards. It uh, removes the cost from a, a big one-time hit, and 
moves it into an annualized operating expense. Um, <coughs> reduce the number of manufacturers and, and the number of trucks that are available, uh, but not to the point that you're looking at something that won't fit your needs. So the second thing that I did, uh, custom-built fire trucks take approximately 18 months to build, and they cost anywhere between $700,000 and a million dollars based on what's happened in Ontario over the last several months. So uh, a custom-built fire truck, we would sit with the fire truck manufacturer and design it right from square one. Uh, it, it obviously becomes expensive because every time they customize, they have to change the design process. So fire truck manufacturers, in between these custom orders, they manufacture um, commercial or demo trucks, is what they call them, demonstration models, where they'll manufacture a truck without all the bells and whistles and without the customization that they'll then use uh, either to sell directly to customers or they'll put them out in the trade shows and on the demonstration circuit. So we, uh, we looked into, I contacted three or four fire truck manufacturers and asked what they had in terms of demonstration models uh, and pre-built trucks. And uh, Fort Gary fire trucks, uh, so I, I should back up. One of the first things that I did was I met with the officers, the captains of the department, and we listed all of the essential functional operation component, operational components. One of the things that I wouldn't say is unique to driving, but it's, it's unique to <coughs> Ontario, is an enclosed pump uh, panel where the pump operator, the person that's actually controlling the flow of water, it's inside the cab of the truck. In southern Ontario, it's common that that person's standing outside of the truck, uh, out in the elements. You know, for, uh, for obvious reasons, in northern Ontario, the, uh, the in internal pump panel is a, is a popular design. So I reached out to manufacturers, listing off the things that were key to us, uh, the, the amount of water that we would require, the pump capacity, uh, and some of the features that the officers uh, found functional, you know, functionally operationally necessary. And uh, Fort Perry Fire Truck came back with a fire truck uh, that's in around the $420,000 mark off the line. And then we'd have to add some equipment to it, radio striping and everything else. So it would come in under our $500,000 budget. In the research that I've done looking at other fire departments in Ontario and talking to other fire truck manufacturers, I'm unable to find another truck that meets our requirements for uh, a similar or lower price. So within the procurement policy, it requires council uh, to waive the procurement procurement guidelines to allow you to single source purchase uh, from Fort Perry Fire Truck. So that's the essence of the report. Questions? Hearing no questions, uh, we'll move that forward to the regular meeting. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Lansdale Roll, welcome. Not have to budget for certain items, and those items were amortized. 
stabilization expenses, post employment benefit expenses, solid waste landfill, and post closure expenses. For, for driving, um, the only thing that's excluded is amortization. And so in the regulation, uh, well, sorry, um, and our amortization is estimated to be in excess of $5.5 million. So the reporting requirements, uh, there's two requirements within this report that are met. Um, so number one, the appendix presented, presents the 2020 budget adjusting for transfers to and from reserve, capital asset acquisitions budgeted in 2020, proceeds from debt, debt principal repayments, and amortization for the purpose of financial reporting. For this exercise, the net result of the adjustment is an estimated surplus of 3.45 million, which would impact the municipality's accumulated surplus slash deficit on the balance sheet. So, so a key note is that um, this adjusted budget per se um, is, a, is a financial restatement uh, on the accrual method and is not going to be the exact same as the annual operating surplus slash deficit that occurs at year end um, from, our, from, our, from our general ledger. This is the, the uh, operating surplus slash deficit that, uh, that we present um, usually in June. So monthly financial reports will continue to be um, communicated and quarterly, quarterly financial reports will be provided to council and those are gonna be the primary management reporting uh, procedures or functions for our municipality. If we were to include amortization expenses in the 2020 budget, um, we would have had to increase our property tax levy by approximately 5.54 million, which represents uh, approximately a 38% increase in the levy, instead of the 0% increase um, that we budgeted for in 2020. So the second reporting requirement is, is uh, speaks to um, are are we spending enough on our capital assets, uh, in, in including those those uh, that information in our financial. So so including that information in our financial statements can assist us in um, determining whether or not we're we're spending appropriately. So by looking at amortization, if we are spending less than our than our assets are depreciating. That's a sign that we may not be spending, spending enough. With that said, amortization is not a very good uh, reference point because amortization um, excludes item that, items that has, have fully, fully amortized. <coughs> so if we acquired an asset 30 years ago and it had a 20 year useful life, that's not going to be included in that 5.5 million. Um, but we have an 30 year old asset that requires replacement. So, so that's one example of why amortization, uh, there's fault flaws in, in, in using that as the, the only com, um, comparable number. The other thing is that um, amortization is based on historical cost. So an asset that cost us a million dollars 20 years ago, if we were to replace it today, it might be $2 million. Um, so there's that uh, um, inadequacy So at the end of the day, um, our 2020 capital plan called for over $6 million of capital spend. So you could say, well, we're spending more than we're amortizing, so that must be a good thing. But our, our most recent asset management plan called for approximately $13 million mm -hmm. in annual spending to address our infrastructure deficit as well as to maintain <coughs> um, our, our assets from a replacement perspective. So I don't think that the six point whatever million that we're anticipating spending in 2020 <coughs> is enough, but um, we need to do a lot more work from, a, from an asset management plan, but also from a financial strategy and getting, and getting that exact number uh, right. Because I don't think, I think the 13 million in our asset management plan was overstated because the majority of the assets or the financials related to those assets from a condition perspective were based on age, not the actual conditions. So, uh, there's lots of work to be done. Um, we'll continue down the path of, of getting better information into our asset management plan and coming up with a more sound financial strategy. But just 
There's a lot of numbers for, for, for reference out there. Um, but I think we need to look at the full scope uh, when we're making decisions. Anyhow, I don't know if there's any questions with regards to the report. Um, there's no financial implications unless council wants to start budgeting for amortization. And I'll, I'll say that there are a small number of municipalities in Ontario that do. Questions? Yep. Yes, through the chair. Yeah, it's probably a subject that finance committee should talk about in a little bit more detail this year as we look to planning for 2021 when we've got our uh, major debt behind us and um, some of those longer term cash flow projections that we've talked about, Stephen, and things of that nature. Maybe we can talk about this subject in there as well as we try to find, <clears throat> hone in on what a more reasonable number for Dryden is going forward something between the accounting number and the conditions assessment based number for replacing assets. Yep, I agree. Other comments? So we, we went through this exercise last year. Yeah, this is an annual requirement every year for any so. municipality that's not budgeting for any one of those three um, items. And it hasn't caused us any issues no, actually, uh, we, we were exposed because historically we were not, uh, council was not passing this report. Right. Thank you. Uh, we move on to your next report. Thank you. Sure. The next re report relates to interim tax, uh, interim tax levy bylaw for 2020. The recommendation is that council approves the adoption <coughs> of bylaw 4702-2020, being a bylaw to approve the interim tax rates for 2020. Tax rates for interim tax levies are set at 50% of the previous municipal and school board rates in accordance with section 317, uh, subsection 1, 2, and 3 of the Municipal Act. Inter interim taxes are issued in early February with two payment dates for installments due on February 29th, 2020 and March 31st, 2020. Issuing of interim taxes for 2020 will provide the municipality with approximately $7.19 million in tax revenue and room would remove the need to borrow funds to pay for municipal programs and services and the city's quarterly payments to the school boards until final uh, bills are issued. So really at the end of the day, um, the Municipal Act allows us to issue interim taxes before final tax bills are, uh, are, are sent out. Um, and this just enables us to have some cash to, to pay for services up until Questions, comments? Nope. Hearing none, we we'll move on to your next report. All right, my last report uh, is relating to a Section 367 uh, reduction uh, or refund of taxes. The recommendation out of this staff report the council accepts the staff recommendation for approval of a Section 357 application is listed uh, below. So, um, this is a, a common report when the treasurer receives an application that is applicable. Um, this is a mandated program within the municipal act. And there are certain criteria that uh, provide eligible relief to property owners. In this case, the assessment included um, a pool that didn't exist, an in-ground pool that uh, previously had existed but uh, was filled in and removed um, uh, years ago but the assessment wasn't updated to reflect that. And the, prop, the current property owners filed a, uh, a 357 uh, adjustment that MPAC has proposed. So these adjustments are almost a, a rubber stamp um, because they're within the municipal act in its uh, mandate. But anyway, I wanted to provide a little bit of background. Um, not a huge impact financially at $61 for 2019 and $122 for 2020. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Nope. So that will move forward with the other two reports to our Thank next you. regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now I'd like to ask Ms. Eiler to present her staff report. Thank you. Um, in November, I brought a report on behalf of the Traffic Committee 
regarding recommendations from the draft <coughs> report sent to the Northwest Catholic District School Board by consultants hired by the board to look at parking issues around the St. Joseph School. At that time, council asked to determine the costs associated with the recommended changes and to look to find alternatives to changing the speed limit on Parkdale Road um, from 50 to 40 kilometers an hour at all times. In this new report, costs of the five recommendations have been broken out. As well, we are presenting two alternatives to the speed limit issue. The first would be to spend up to $25,000 in legislated signage to create a school zone on Parkdale Road. However, by legislation, a school zone can only be within 150 meters of a school, and this would not take in the crosswalks. Second alternative would be to change the speed limit on Parkdale Road to 40 kilometers an hour at all times, but only between Casimir and Colonization Avenues, and it would create, also create a community safety zone that would uh, encompass the crosswalks on Parkdale Road and Colonization Avenue. And as uh, noted in my report, uh, in a community safety zone, the cost of traffic fines is doubled. Uh, are there any questions about this report? Questions, comments? You're going to need some direction on yes, the alternatives. Are we satisfied with the recommendation? I'm sorry, Mr. Nesbitt, go ahead. Uh, through the chair, just, um, just to maybe, I guess, uh, help counsel out with a <clears throat> recommendation, at least for myself, after, you know, after looking at our different options to, uh, to uh, reduce speed through that section uh, where the St. Joseph School is located, I, uh, I, I think a school zone would be um, a, a good way to go. If, uh, if council wasn't opposed to looking at uh, at the uh, expense of implementing the proper signage and such, it does allow the uh, the speed limit to fluctuate uh, during certain times when school is uh, is in session, and uh, and allows the citizens to uh, to I guess enjoy the uh, the higher speed limit when uh, when school is not. In. So that would be. That would be my recommendation after looking at the different options. Is it a, a question? That, so that will not encompass the crosswalk? Uh, by, yeah, legislation states that it's a uh, 50 uh, meter maximum. And that's outside of But um, th th there may be other opportunities to address the, uh, the crosswalk as well, proper signage and such outside of uh, the, uh, the school zone. Councillor Carter, our mayor, I'm sure. Uh, Councillor McKinnon, thank you. Can we move the crosswalk? Is that even an option? Like, uh, through the chair, the, the crosswalk is placed there um, because that is the uh, the concentration of, of pedestrian traffic coming from, I guess we'll call it southern uh, driving. Catholic. Yeah, a, a lot of the uh, school kids. Uh, Come up from the, the Thunder nice Drive, Wobbleman Drive, Lakeside Drive area. They come up through uh, through Dingwall Park, yeah. and then Dingwall Parkway to that yeah. to that location. And then whether you're traveling to the high school, Open Roads, St. Joseph's School, that's that's where they cross. So it okay. definitely makes sense to keep the crosswalk there. Maybe if I Thanks. yes, I was going to ask Mr. Poole, is there not some legislation? Yeah, I, on the I, hill. Years ago, I yeah. calculation based on that. Uh, if you could put it there, due to the sight lines of the hill there, the stopping distance on the hill for a you can expect the sight lines, icy condition, it, it, you cannot situate it that close to the school. So where it sits, as Roger says, does help other uh, school children for going to different schools and things like that. So we couldn't move it. Yeah, I was, I was just asking the question. Yeah. Other comments? Councilor McKay. Thanks for the chair. Um, 
Allison, was there uh, uh, recommendations made by the, the uh, Catholic School Board's consultant? <coughs> These are the those recommendations are for the cities. Okay. Yeah, the five that are in there were their recommendations for us. So we're. Okay, thank you. So I, I guess the question is um, recommendations one, two, three, and five. Are we satisfied with those? Get that off the. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are coming back to number four then. Um, and the two options appear below. And the recommendation coming from uh, Mr. Nesbitt is that we look at a school zone on Parkdale. Again, through Mr. the chair, Nesbitt. just so council is clear, I think, I think there's three options in front of council. One is um, keep it as cool. it is, yeah. don't adjust the speed limit on Parkdale at all. Uh, look at, at implementing a reduced speed zone full time between areas of cashmere and colonization. Mm -hmm. And then the third option is actually implementing a safety school zone with the proper signage and such that would allow a speed reduction uh, only during the times that it's required, basically when school is in session. At, at the estimated costs that are in the report. So if we left it at status quo as far as speed, uh, would we consider the other four um, steps that we took? Would they mitigate the, or they would produce the desired effect um, of safety there? All of, again, through the chair, all of the recommendations are geared towards safety. Uh, the speed limit reduction, though, is, is uh, in my opinion, a good strategy to increase the safety of, uh, of the pedestrians around the school, especially during those peak times of uh, loading and unloading. It, uh, it's extremely busy <clears throat> along the block where the school is situated. And um, to be able to travel through there at, uh, at 50 kilometers an hour is, uh, is a fairly high speed for that amount of activity, congestion in that area. Councilor McKay. Uh, through the chair, I, I have to agree with much. I, I'm all for uh, school zone because just calling it a school zone, people are educated enough to open. It's a school zone, I know I have to reduce my speed. I think that's the estimate of 20,000, was it, or 25,000? Mm -hmm. may ultimately be uh, well spent money. Okay. Um, I agree with that, um, and I think we could probably in the future look at other areas of the community where that should be instituted. But So we're going to move forward with this with that recomm recommendation for those five items. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that at the next regular meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We we'll move on to notices of motion. We have no notices of motion this evening. Um, announcements, Councillor Bush. Uh, nothing further to add to tonight, Councillor McKinnon. Thank you, Councillor Carlucci. No, just a happy New Year to everybody, and uh, glad to be back. Councillor Martin McKinnon. <coughs> the same. Happy New Year, everyone. Councillor McKay. Very happy with snow removal. It's uh, it's been. Uh, Pretty cleaned up and looking pretty good around town. So. Councilor Price. Uh, same. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. And as for myself, I, I'm very much looking forward to uh, 2020. I think that we have um, a, a great council and uh, great staff working uh, in the city of Dryden. And I think it's going to be a very exciting year. I think lots of things are going to happen in our community. Um, and we are going to uh, be an essential part of that. So. Thank you, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. Now, we will ask Councillor McKay to read a motion. Uh, moved by myself, second by uh, Councillor Price, 
that this meeting do hereby adjourn. All in favor? Okay. We're clear. All right. Good night, everybody. Microphones. Thank you.